Hi everyone, welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast. This is the this is the show about Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today for episode 183, my guests are from the company Acquainting. So we're going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin and tax strategy. But first, I'm going to introduce the sponsors of the show. So this show is brought to you by Swan Bitcoin. If you are in the US, you absolutely should get your auto stacking on with Swan. The process is so simple, even a no-coiner could do it. So step one, you auto fund with USD from your bank account. Two, you auto stack the Bitcoin. And three, you withdraw to your cold storage. Swan does not charge withdrawal fees. They want you to follow Bitcoin best practices and hold your own keys. Swan crushes Coinbase's fees for recurring buys up to 80% and beats cash app fees by 57%, up to. Uh, set it and forget. Enjoy your life. Swan and chill. So go to swanbitcoin.com slash Levera to start auto stacking with, with Swan today. Next is Unchained Capital, Bitcoin native financial services. So if you are looking to increase your, improve your security setup, you want to get a multi-signature two of three setup going, you can use Unchained Capital. And the website for that is unchained-capital.com. You can use Trezor and Ledger. You can create the vault on, a, on the website and then geographically split up your keys. So you've also got the facility. If you need liquidity, you can put up Bitcoin and get a USD loan. And in that scenario, you still hold one of three keys. Unchained Capital are doing a lot of great work in the ecosystem around uh, open source contributions as well. So they've got Hermit, which is around Shamir's secret sharing, and also Caravan, which is a multi-signature coordinator. So go and check them out at unchained-capital.com. All right, so I'm just going to bring in my guests today, who are Clinton and Dennis. Welcome, guys. Hey. It's a pleasure having us here. Yeah, so thank you guys for joining me. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, obviously tax is not something people want to talk about, but I think at the same time, it's one of those things where I have probably a lot of listeners who would be interested to understand how to think about some of these different issues and what are some strategies that they could uh, employ. So look, first off, maybe if you guys want to just start off and tell us a little bit about yourselves and also if there's any, you know, disclaimers and so on that you need to uh, make. Yeah, so my name is Dennis. I co-founded Acquainting um, officially in 2018. We had a system running before that because um, we're like a group of investors and we're in the market since since many years. And we basically at some point faced the problem of um, keeping track of all our investments and like, especially back in the days of ICOs and all the things that were happening back then. And so we decided to basically build um, a tracking tool for ourselves just backend tool and in 2018 we went public with it to support like the crypto market a little bit in in terms of keeping track of everything creating tax reports for different countries and we're now at the point where we support the us Aust uh, Aust austria switzerland uk uh, and germany for specific tax reports and um other countries with with uh, specific like with a uh, general output format so that's that's kind of a quick introduction <laughs> sure and clinton uh yes my name is clinton donnelly and i'm with donnelly tax law we do tax preparation and defend uh people with tax audits of their cryptos i do tax preparation in the united states but i have uh, a very international experience i have a uh an advanced law degree in international financial regulation, including taxation. Got it to the University of Liverpool uh, in the UK. And then also I have uh, clients in 48 different countries, uh, you know, my, mainly Americans uh, in 48 countries who are basically exploring, you know, the tax implications of either doing business in the US or being Americans living outside the US. I have a significant practice with cryptocurrencies, uh, cryptocurrency return preparation, tax amnesty related to those things. So I have four books out on cryptocurrency and uh, I do a lot of uh, speaking about it. That's fantastic. So look, yeah, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, I think, you know, the naive person first thinking about Bitcoin, depending on you know how they've acquired that Bitcoin, they might think, oh yeah, I'm super private and so on. What's the reality in terms of Bitcoin taxes and what are some of the typical things that people need to be thinking about in the world of Bitcoin taxation? Well, uh, let me make a comment on that. The international community has decided that Bitcoin would, is considered a virtual asset. It's property. It's not. It's not currency. It's not a. It's not a cryptocurrency, uh, from a from an international point of view. So as such, 
taxation occurs when you uh, sell or exchange that Bitcoin. So merely buying a Bitcoin is not going to be a taxable event. If you're hodling that Bitcoin uh, for a couple of years, there's no taxes involved. It's only when I sell it or exchange it that I'm going to incur taxes. So on the gain. Now, you know, with, if Bitcoin hits the moon this year, you know, what sort of thinking would your listeners want to have in terms of taxes? Because uh, the one thing about taxes, it's usually a percentage of your income. Now, on one hand, I'd say I'd wish all your your listeners to have incredible tax bills. That means they made incredible amounts of money, all right? But that being said, how do we minimize what we do have to pay and not give the government or any government more than they need to get, you know, legally? So, yep. uh, you know, that I think that's really the thing. And ta- when you think about taxes, it's going to they're going to take depending on what jurisdiction you're in, 25 to 50% of your money that you've You've worked so hard in, in investing. So you, a tax strategy is just as important as an investment strategy. Right. And so uh, I think the important thing there really is it's almost like the tax tax agents and the tax law of the land is in, is encouraging people to hodl, right? Like that's, that's kind of the encouraged position because <clears throat> it's only when you actually sell or spend that Bitcoin that you actually have to even think about these taxes, right? That's exactly right. You know, in most countries in the world, the governments want to encourage investment. Now, uh, there's investing can happen where you buy it and you hold it for a long time, or investing can happen when you just you're like a day trader. You're in and out, in and out. Well, corporations cannot really grow a business if they're on day traders. Okay, investing in their company, they want somebody who's going to invest and they're going to leave that money there for a year, two years, whatever. And that way, the corporation knows that they can bank on that investment. So governments incent that by having maybe one or having extra tax tiers for capital gains. Capital gains is what you call selling property. So the issue is like most countries have a, a long-term capital gains incentive. Uh, I know in the U.S. it's it's uh, your tax rate goes down to 15%. In certain countries, it goes down to zero or some very small amount, or after so many years, it's zero. So this is uh, the incentive, and that is a significant reward uh, for the hodler to really be aware and you know, have I hit that long-term capital gains market? For, in most countries, that's the easiest, most legal thing to do is to go for the long-term capital gains incentive on your taxes. Right, and and uh, my understanding as well, and perhaps this obviously varies internationally, uh, but my understanding, at least from the Australian um, uh, position of it, is that it it matters whether your income is being treated as your business is one of trading or your business is one of you are investing and speculating. And that's where, so if you're in the trading world, it's seen as like, well, your trading income, you earned a hundred thousand dollars. That's your income for the year. But in the, for most people, it's, it's in the capital gains kind of world of it's an asset. And when you made a gain, you are taxed on the gain. That's, is that uh, essentially a fair way to think about it? Yeah, it definitely is. So like, like Linton already said, it's, it's a little bit different in all the, in, in every country and for example in Germany you have after holding it for one year you have um, uh, zero uh, taxable gain or like you, you don't have to pay taxes on it because it just becomes long term obviously there's um, you need to be careful there if you are trading a lot of like margin trading derivatives of these kinds of um, of trading activities you need to be careful that you don't uh, get treated as as a company as an investment company where because it basically changes the rules a little bit and you have to um, open a business for that. But most investors, and I'm really talking about investors that maybe trade a few times per month, they, they usually don't have a problem with that. And um, so <clears throat> based on, on that holding period, there's also a few good parts that you can use there. So obviously, if you buy Bitcoin or any other crypto asset at a high price, and the price drops, you can use that and, and tax loss harvest or basically sell this loss and use it as uh, a loss for the coming years when you maybe have, uh, when you create some gains. So it really depends on um, on how or when you invested in crypto. And so that's one big part, I guess, that we also offer for our clients um, of a coin team because we basically allow everyone to import all the transactions all the trades for free and we have different tools to um monitor and to display the holding 
trading periods or assets. Because imagine you trade in different exchanges, you hold it in different Bitcoin wallets. You never know where, what Bitcoin is actually long term. So that means has a lower tax rate and what Bitcoin is um, in the short term gains. So you need to be careful there. And we have a way of um, displaying that. Um, there's also a little bit more for the optimization part. You can obviously go really deep into that. So there's different ways of tracking. You can keep track of your investments in one single depot. That means you buy Bitcoin and then you use, in most countries, they use uh, first in, first out method to calculate which Bitcoin or cost basis you actually have to use when you sell something. So there's um, a single depot version where you put everything in one Excel file and you use the oldest one. Um, uh, like the oldest Bitcoin cost basis that you have and sell that. But in most cases, that's not what you want to do, especially if you do more day trading. So um, a good way of optimizing a little bit more in the micro, in the micro field here is to um, keep track of everything with a multiple depot tracking. That means if you buy something in one exchange, you send it to your wallet, this cost basis gets tra transferred to the wallet and when you buy something else on, an, on another exchange and you day trade there with Bitcoin, you, you just sell the Bitcoin that are really on this exchange and you don't touch your long-term investments. And so with that strategy, you obviously can um, trade a few percentages of your portfolio and the rest you can keep separate and, and uh, go for the long-term gains. So it really depends because obviously if in 2017 you would have like an investment of, I don't know, maybe 10 Bitcoin and they're just six months old and you don't sell them and afterwards the Bitcoin price crashes, there's a trade-off of would it be better to sell um, at that high prices or is it better to hold? So it really depends on, on what you expect the market to do in the future. So it's obviously good to optimize for taxes, but not all the time when you trade. So that's really that trade-off that you have to um, that you have to use there. Um, I say, yeah. yeah, I mean, in, for example, there's like countries like Switzerland where you don't pay any gains on your crypto trades. It's just wealth tax at the end of the year. So um, obviously, if you're lucky and you live in this country and you want to do day trading, it's a little bit easier. Um, but you can really make that happen everywhere in the world. Yeah. And so the first point you mentioned there was around tax loss harvesting. So um, I guess just kind of replaying my understanding of that is you, you purchase at a certain price and now the price has fallen, and now yeah. you basically what people do is they sell and rebuy uh, to kind of lower their cost basis, so that then now it, in future tax pays tax um, the future yeah. they'll have a loss that they will be able to use against their gains in the future. Is that is that right? Exactly. That's that's correct. So and. And if you do that, um, you you basically um, want to use the like all you always want to sell that before it's older than a year because you can actually use more losses to for for future gains because the tax rate is higher. In Germany, for example, if you sell after the year because the tax rate for long term holdings is zero, you don't have any losses that you can um, subtract from your future gains because it's just not taxable anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, yeah. So then the other point was just around what you might consider segregation. So for those people who are traders, they might have a holding amount that's treated like a long term. That's their long term holding. That's going to be test taxed as an asset at a CGT sort of style. Whereas if they're trading, that's like a separate portion uh, of their you know bitcoins, let's say. And then mm -hmm. if they are a trader. Um, then that is what gets assessed on a different basis because that's more like standard income, right? Yep, exactly. So you don't want to mix those two depots up. So obviously you can use um, different strategies there. You can just, once you, if you buy Bitcoin every month, for example, you can just use different addresses and put these Bitcoin in there um, from the beginning. If you mix them up and if you, um, traded over the last years and you now want to actually use that method, you can um, use, like like I said, this this um, displaying tool that we offer and we basically tell you in which um, 
depot you have long-term holdings and short-term holdings and what's the trade-off between them so it's kind of like you can basically go deep into that and analyze and then use the correct bitcoin maybe from your wallet number 10 um to sell now because this would actually create a loss and um on the other hand the bitcoin that you have hold on coinbase would create a gain right so in the end you sell one bitcoin but you can sell the correct one um in order to create a loss with that trade yeah and uh i'm also curious how people typically deal with it when they've got multiple wallets or multiple exchange accounts what's the typical way that uh, you and your you know customers normally deal with that yeah so we we just allow um our customers to connect um their exchanges directly either with an api or direct connection if the exchange offers that um for bitcoin and for other blockchains we have an import of like all the historical data through an xpub ypub or just normal um, bitcoin addresses you can then combine that all in in one in one portfolio and we keep track of all the things that like of the entire money flow in your in your system so that means if you send something from like from your first exchange to your bitcoin wallet we have um that connection through the transaction id and we create so-called internal transactions and these internal transactions are not a taxable event like they even create a fee because it's like the transfer fee that you can use later as a cost that you that you actually spend for uh, transferring those bitcoin um and we use that internal transaction to you to transfer the cost basis from this first wallet to your second wallet and we always keep it with with that bitcoin and so that's really nice because you can with that actually go back and really deep dive into that money flow and you have everything completely tracked it's obviously not 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 all like it's 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 really nice to have that not not only for tax purposes but also um to prove to your bank where you got the funds from i mean a lot of banks especially if you if you trade with higher amounts they want to know where you where you got that investment from right because it could be some money laundering activity if you can track the entire history that makes that easier I see. Yeah. And so that's one way where you sort of aggregate across all of your wallets, all of your exchanges uh, into one thing. And I guess the other part is you, I guess, if, if, because when you sell, that's a capital gains uh, event, uh, typically. And so it's kind of just you want to sort of have the record there to say this wasn't a sale this wasn't me spending this is me self spending right and so that's not treated as a capital gain etc and therefore not taxed on that exactly or you even yeah. use it as like you, you send a gift or you um you did some other activity with it right so you can just prove where it, where it went and um in some countries like for example in germany we currently um sue the government or we are in court against the government there because we don't agree with the tax regulations so we kind of say that a payment shouldn't be a taxable event and we also say that people that actually report their taxes in in germany especially they are not like they're the truthful people right they they report hey i made some gains there i, I in theory i have to pay taxes but it's not fair because the government actually that can't prove that other people that don't report taxes um, uh, like do uh, uh, tax fraud because they just don't have a way to go into the blockchain at this point or into the different exchanges because they're somewhere all over the world, right? So they cannot prove that you traded, but um, they want truthful people to pay taxes and that's not legal in Germany. So that's why we're currently suing, um, suing the German government there or like that tax regulation and try to make it clear to them that it's, Either they can do that for everyone, which I doubt they can, or they, they are not allowed to, to file taxes um, on crypto investments or on crypto trading. So that's kind of like one part that we try to, to do for, for the German community, at least. Um, I mean, Clinton knows more about the US part, and there's obviously also like some really exciting things happening in the future. I mean, there's uh, a few discussions, right, where they they try to not treat payments as a taxable event, which would be obviously really nice. But I mean, um, considering all the things that are happening in the market with Lightning, with uh, all the DeFi that is coming into the market, I, I don't know how they want to do it. Like Right, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that. So this idea of payments and the taxation that occurs on them, 
like theoretically from the capital gains tax point of view. So I guess what you're getting at here is, I don't know, for example sake, let's say you buy $100 worth of Bitcoin and then later it's $200 worth of Bitcoin. And then if you now spent, you know, a portion of that, then like I guess the point you're getting at there is theoretically there is a capital gain on which, um, you know, like it, 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 governments uh, want their pound of flesh on that. And yeah. so what what are some of the different ways that is treated from a you know taxation law perspective well you got the challenge i mean if i sell bitcoin and buy uh a car you know so i have capital gains when i dispose of that bitcoin i bought it at a lower price i'm selling it at some higher price that's equivalent to what i'm paying for the car that's the capital gains and so we see countries like uh Portugal, who are saying, well, if you pay for Bitcoin, we're not going to have a VAT tax involved, which you can start to see, well, hey, that's kind of a duplicate tax here, a VAT on, on top of a, of a capital gains. So, you know, and then um, in the U.S., they it's just a sales tax. The tax is on what is sold, not the means by which you paid for it. So it's a little bit different structure. But, you know, really cryptocurrencies are just turning the, the tax um, – regimes upside down because we see here with with a blockchain technology DeFi and smart contracts and all these really exciting innovations are just transforming the financial industry and turning upside down our whole notion of currency and property and uh especially from a tax and accounting point of view uh you know, and, and as uh, Dennis was mentioning, his own company was how how do we do accounting when we're no longer trading in in fiat currency? We're trading in in a in a, a Bitcoin. You know, and, th and it's an asset that's constantly changing value relative to the fiats in which we have to report our our, our uh, business results in to the tax authority. So it's 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 everything's getting very complicated. And what we're finding, the tax authorities are finding, is that defining cryptocurrencies merely as an asset merely as property is really not adequate uh because it's changing so fast uh it's becoming far more than mere property nor is it adequate to call it currency because it's not embraced by one government and, and all that's involved in that so i think what we're seeing uh tax authorities are really kind of they're they're holding back in coming forward with new taxation regimes targeted at cryptocurrencies because they just don't know where it's going and they don't want to hamper uh, progress by having uh, tax rules which are, make no sense as as the technology progresses. So I, th I think we're going to see uh, taxation rules that are much like property continue at least for the next uh, five years until, until there's a real settling down of this this massive evolution in finance uh, that's frustrating to some people, but uh, you know, I think there will be something newer and better coming out of it. Right. Yeah. So I guess for most people who are just holding it's, it's going to be treated as property and then it'll just be the CGT. So then I suppose for most people, they're just looking at what are ways to legally minimize my taxes on that. And so I guess one of them is tax loss harvesting. One of them might be, you know, if if you can move to a better jurisdiction, things like that. Are they are they typical strategies that people are are employing, uh, or even like that the whole collateralized loan idea as well of like putting up some Bitcoin, getting USD, so that you're not incurring a, a capital gains event. I suppose these are some of the strategies that people typically employ. Are they what you see in your experience, or are there any other ones that people are employing? Well, yes. I mean, there's. Lots of those people are putting in trusts and then getting payments from the trust. I mean, these are sort of all variations. You're just kind of, there's a little bit of a shell game here. You're moving the tax to different places. The tax eventually gets paid. You know, you're, you're trying to, the thing with like you mentioned with the collateralized, collateralized loans is you're, you know, that's a great strategy if you want to use the value of a short-term asset until it's been collateralized long enough that you can characterize it as a long-term asset and then sell it uh at the long-term capital gains rates that's you know that makes sense these are just small micro strategies if you really are someone who if you're let's say you're a whale you have massive positions in bitcoin you know and you see yourself liquidating a lot of this then you know uh the one strategy if you really want to you know let's say improve on the long-term capital gains rate would be to relocate so you know let's let's put a framework in place 
to how would we make that decision? So if I were to relocate somewhere, you know, I have, uh, you know, first of all, I'm selling where I'm at. I'm moving somewhere else. I'm incurring new expenses. What's the cost of living there? What's the quality of living? Will I find myself so bored I'm flying back to, uh, you know, I could be living in an island in the South Pacific and being so bored I'm flying back to Sydney every month to go to, a, you know, an opera show. You know, so there, there's some quality of life things. You also have issues relative to access to banking. Uh, clearly, with liquidating some Bitcoin, you want to be able to put that into a bank and get access to it. Well, what bank, you know, can you open up a bank in that foreign jurisdiction? People may ask, why are you coming to uh, Bali to open up a bank account? Why are you coming to British Virgin Islands to open up a bank account if you live in Europe, if you live in Australia? So it's, it's, these are valid, uh, know your client type of, you know, due diligence questions that are maybe difficult for you to open up a bank. If you don't have a bank, then moving is it's going to be a, a foolish thing to do. Uh, so, uh, so we and then you, let's think about the cost of that. So, let's say all you, ha if your upside is that you have a hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, uh, long-term capital gains rates. Let's just use the U.S. ones of fifteen percent. That means your tax is fifteen thousand dollars. What can you do that's going to reduce fifteen thousand dollars? Well, if you move somewhere. Well, you might end up pay, spending. It might be zero tax right there, but you might be costing more than the fifteen thousand to have moved. Right now, if you had a uh, hundred thousand Bitcoin, all right. So we're talking about a lot of money. Now we're thinking, you know, I might be slowly liquidating my positions over multiple years. Uh, how much am I going to liquidate on a yearly basis? Will I be liquidating a hundred thousand? Well, that means. I'd be generating normally a fifteen thousand dollar tax. Uh, will I do better living somewhere else? Well, possibly. You know, if, if on an ongoing basis you're doing that. So, you know, Portugal has a, an interesting tax regime of zero tax. And it's a nice cultural area. It's Europe. That's very good. BVI. Uh, a lot of people. I mean, that's one of the topics. Uh, look, any of the Caribbean countries, the Seychelles, they all have a very in, uh, interesting tax regime. The problem with these banks is if you have a if you're doing something with a Seychelles bank, a BVI bank, uh, any other bank in the world is going to raise a red flag on that. So uh, it's very, very difficult to work with uh, let's gray bank, gray countries that are in the gray area when it comes to anti-money laundering laws. Uh, the U.S. Uh, would be in Puerto Rico are, are two really exciting options, both for Europeans and non-Europeans or Euro Americans. So. I'd be happy to dig into those some more if you'd like. Sure, yeah, I think um, let's let's talk a little bit about some of the some of the you know good places around the world. As you mentioned, I know Portugal has no capital gains tax. I know Singapore has no capital gains tax. I know uh, Switzerland has none. Um, and then so Germany, as you mentioned, Dennis. I think if you hold for more than one year, there's no capital gains tax. So I think it's kind of like depending on where you look around the world, there might be some places that are a little bit better and others not so much. Uh, but what are what are the ways that people would explore if they were to like let's say they had enough that it was worthwhile for them to consider moving? What are the ways that they would explore that? Look, let's take the situation of someone who's not an American. I'd propose to you that the best place for your money to invest is the United States. It is the largest tax haven in the world, uh, and it is because the financial industry is a very important part of the U.S. economy, and they've created very strong incentives to attract foreign money. Particularly, uh, there's zero capital gains if you're a foreigner uh, on your assets, uh, you know, on crypto assets in the U.S. Uh, you're very likely to get, if you go to like Bank of America, Citibank, Wells Fargo, these major banks, you know, you as a foreigner can easily open up a bank account. You'll have to go there physically and open one up, but they're not going to, it's not going to be a question as to why is somebody from Australia, uh, somebody from Switzerland coming to the U.S. to open up a bank account because the U.S. is wants to be the marketplace for the world. So that's not a problem. And you want these major banks because they're accustomed to international wire transfers. If you have an account at a U.S. bank, uh, nobody's going to question that from an anti-money laundering perspective. If I'm trying to transfer money back to Australia or, or that sort of thing, it's, you know, it's widely respected as opposed to like a BVI bank or credit card. Uh, and the other thing the U.S. does that um, is the information sharing between countries about how much money uh, citizens have in foreign bank accounts. Uh, the U.S. has one called the FATCA law. All the banks in the world have to tell the U.S. IRS twice a year 
about American bank accounts in foreign countries. Uh, in response to that, the OECD countries created the Common Reporting Standard, CRS, which uh, at this point, I think about 100 countries have signed up to, where once a year, they will report back to the citizen's home country the total amount of your bank account. So uh, the U.S. didn't sign that. The U.S. did the sign the common reporting standards. The U.S. You have a bank account in the U.S. The U.S. doesn't tell any other country about it. So, you know, it's kind of uh, uh, ironic. <laughs> I, I guess that's maybe like the bully. <laughs> you know, they demand that everybody give my information to them, but they won't share anyone else. But this is a this is because they're the biggest financial part player out there. They can actually have this, whereas uh, it is considered a bit of a tax. Uh, haven, low tax jurisdiction. But for everybody who's not a United States citizen, this is a great place to put your money because it's a rich investment area. You can move your money out of cryptos when you want to put it into some of the safest banks in the world, invest in some of the best real estate in the country, Wall Street. I mean, there's a lot of, it's rich financial area uh, and the very strong incentives. And you just get a, a US credit card, a, you know, like a Bank of America credit card, use that the rest of your life, buying things all over the world. Uh, and your local jurisdiction would have no visibility uh, to it unless you disclosed it to them. So that's a very attractive uh, one to do without having to, you know, change residence. Right, I see. So that would be the model. That would be one idea if you don't even want to actually become like a U.S. citizen and all of that. You just are opening an account in the U.S. Um, and so I guess then there's the other options as well of actually like moving or actually, let's say, getting residence in, say, BVI or multiple places. Uh, I, I presume that's also an option that some of your uh, clients might explore as well. For some of them, it might be worthwhile for them to consider that. I do a lot of consulting in this area. Um, for virtually every... Uh, for virtually every country, the principle of taxation is that if you're in the country more than six months, then you're subject to taxation in that country. Typically, you're subject to taxation on your worldwide income uh, in that jurisdiction where you've been living for six months. Now, uh, the U.S. Uh, has a different tax law. They tax their citizens on their worldwide income, regardless of where they live in the world. So it's a little different wrinkle for Americans. But... Um, a common underlying theme in international taxation is it's based on residency. Residency is typically defined as six months or 185, 183 days. It varies uh, how you define it, but roughly it's the six month thing. So this creates a massive international tax loophole, which I would call a, a three country shuffle, where if you're, if you're never more than six months in one country in a the given time period, then you can just keep moving around. It's kind of like the digital nomad strategy. You keep moving around. Nobody's, you're not going to have to report taxes to anyone. So uh, that that's is, presuming you're not a U.S. citizen, right? Presuming mm -hmm. you're not a U.S. citizen. Yeah. Uh, now, U.S. citizens have a different uh, problem. Uh, U.S. citizens are taxed on your income worldwide. However, there are two massive tax breaks that are given to them. One is uh, for every dollar they pay in taxes to a foreign country, they get like a dollar to dollar, dollar for dollar credit back on their own tax bill. Okay, that's nice. Uh, relatively speaking, the U.S. taxes are lower than most other countries, developed countries. So if I were a citizen, I have clients living in Germany and their German tax bill is greater than their U.S. tax bill. So we still do a U.S. tax return. They take the German credit and they don't, have, they don't owe anything back to the U.S. Uh, however, if that's... If you're an American citizen, you're living in a low jurisdiction, low tax jurisdiction, uh, you're still going to have to report back to the U.S. and probably end up paying taxes back to the U.S. Now, for American citizens, there is a fantastic uh, loophole called Puerto Rico. Now, Puerto <laughs> Rico is uh, a little country south of Florida, next to Cuba, in this area. Uh, it's a possession of the United States. It's not a state, although there's always talk about statehood. It's a possession. Now, in the U.S. tax law, if you're a possession, you're treated uh, kind of like as though you're living in a foreign country. And Puerto Rico, of all the U.S. possessions, negotiated the right to tax their own citizens. So you're not – if you're a Puerto Rican citizen and all your income comes from being in Puerto Rico, you do not file a U.S. tax return. Uh, Puerto Rico pays its share uh, to the U.S. government uh, on your behalf. So this creates an interesting loophole. Uh, and now Puerto Rico uh, 
Caribbean country, not a lot of indigenous resources. They've been crushed by earthquakes, tsunamis, <clears throat> hurricanes. I mean, it's, it, the country's bankrupt. Uh, however, uh, they've created a incentive that they call, it's now called Act 60, formerly Act 22, where it's a 0% tax on your capital gains. So if you move, so if you're an American uh, and you're a whale and you want to do this, you can move to Puerto Rico. And it really means move. It's not like go visit for a day and then go back to California. No, you really are moving to Puerto Rico for at least six months of the year, in which case uh, 0% tax on your capital gains when on the, crypt, the Bitcoin that you sell when you're in Puerto Rico. Um, and, and this is that's a fantastic thing. Now, there are some costs. You have to make a $10,000 donation to Puerto Rican charities. There's a $5,000 annual fee you pay, and you got to buy a house or apartment in Puerto Rico and you can't rent it out. So there's some serious out-of-pocket costs, but uh, it's probably worth it for that extra 15% savings if you're a, a whale Bitcoin holder in the U.S. That'd be the, the movement for you. Fantastic. Yeah, so that's a very, very nice breakdown there. So I guess break, breaking that down. So if you're a non-U.S. Uh, person, then it might make sense for you to do this whole three different countries different residencies, et cetera. But if you're in the U.S., potentially one idea is moving to Puerto Rico. Uh, one other idea I was interested to discuss or related to what we were just saying is what it takes to break your nexus with your home country, right? So as I understand, it's kind of like you have to sort of break that. Uh, as you said, it's mostly about the six months or 180 days aspect. Are there any other things there that people have to think about in terms of uh, breaking that connection so that they... Uh, can be uh, can access the you know lower tax rate. Now, usually, getting a divorce helps. <laughs> 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 I'm just silly, uh, but yeah, I mean, usually it's like oh, I want to go back to visit mother and that sort of thing. You know, you're there is a bit of travel to it. I mean, you're basically if you take that strategy, you're at least saying I'm going to be outside, uh, depending on which country you're from, outside of that my home country for you know nine to eleven months of the year at least. So, um, and I would say uh, a couple of things to think about. There are, you know, think of cost of living. Think of uh, creating for your family, uh, you know, awareness of other cultures, okay, speaking other languages. And, uh, you know, there are websites, I think, uh, if you search for expat costs living in different cities, there's a couple of websites like um, uh, ex, um I don't come to, or something like that. I can't remember now. Yeah. There's several websites where you plug in, you know, two cities and it'll tell you the comparative cost of living. And I'll tell you, it, it's it, the cost of living changes a lot uh, between different countries. And uh, I think it's also, you know, I just think it's a great thing to do. Just, once you start traveling, you get the bug. Now, what I find is well, I've worked with you know, digital nomads is they travel a little bit and then they decide to have a home base. And they stay there, you know, five months of the year and then they move around or they, you know, different, that sort of thing. But uh, if you are not a U.S. citizen, if you're willing to do a, a three country shuffle, uh, put your investments in U.S. crypto exchanges, uh, and have crypto, you know, or at least in wallets and then use U.S. banks, you can really move towards a pretty close to zero tax situation and see the world at the same time. <laughs> That's very impressive, I think. Um, so uh, I guess I, I think another area that you were touching on as well, Clinton, was just around the dynamic between the different countries of the world, right? So as you were saying, some of the it's almost like there are certain pressures where some countries try to push onto each other of reporting, taxation levels and so on. But then there's also this dynamic where you were saying that it's almost like the richer countries allow certain nations to keep lower taxes and to have kind of relatively less uh, kind of rules around that. Could you explain that dynamic a little bit for us? Well, there was a real concern as right before globalization in the 80s, starting in the 80s, that we had issues with um, international drug trafficking. We had uh, people like Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines who pretty much uh, looted his own country and took the proceeds and took them to Swiss and Liechtenstein banks and trusts. And so the international community got together and said, we have to stop this. And they created anti-money laundering laws 
which are coordinated through the Financial Action Task Force, the IMF, and, and the OECD is the Organization of Developed Countries, about 34 countries, and they did not like tax havens either. Tax havens, you know, like Seychelles, uh, BVI, Belize, these little countries that were basically siphoning off a lot of money uh, and bringing no value, uh, you know, to their area. So they clamped down on those using the same anti-money laundering laws. Uh, and what that ended up doing was it forced people back to the OECD countries. It basically made it a club of the haves, right? Uh, so, you know, the OECD countries treat themselves as, uh, a, you know, A plus countries for putting your money and everybody else is uh, dodgy and gray and don't want to trust them. So, uh, that really crushed the small island uh, tax haven network. Uh, but at the same time, uh, like in Europe, they realize in Europe we have rich countries, um, Germany, uh, France, but we also have very small countries, Luxembourg, Netherlands, who have very small revenue streams. Uh, and they need to allow them to have a, a more latitude to have incentives or lower tax options to bring business there. So, well, EU is very good about that. But uh, other countries in the world have to fend for themselves. Uh, this is a massive issue uh, by which countries compete with each other. There's a massive competition. I mean, uh, U.S. used to have some of the highest corporate tax rates. It was at 35%. I, I think uh, in France was higher. But then uh, the U.K., and Ireland slashed their corporate tax rates significantly. UK slashed it down to uh, 20% on a phased method. The Ireland brought it down all, for foreign countries working in Ireland down to 12.5% corporate tax. This is this is a very big incentive. This is part of the reason why Google, Facebook, Apple all moved their call centers to Ireland. So a couple other reasons too. But uh, you know, so. What the U.S. did in order to change its international competitiveness is they slashed their corporate tax rates down to 21%, which makes it exceptionally aggressive. And the, it's designed to bring big companies who might have been in other countries, bring them back home to the U.S. So there is a real war uh, going on for the tax revenues of multinational corporations uh, by countries that are uh, lowering their tax rates to bring them in. So this is only going to get more uh, competitive. And it's going to be, as people, countries start to do that, they're going to have to fund it by putting more of the tax burden back on the individual. Uh, I know like in the U.S., I was looking at a pie chart and uh, individuals pay roughly 80% of all the taxes in the U.S. To the, to the IRS. The rest of it's corporate taxes. Now, the argument would be, if I put a tax on uh, companies that make shirts, if you go and buy a shirt in Australia, Stefan, then your shirt is going to be more expensive because you're paying the company's tax, all right? So company taxes are indirectly a tax back on the individual. Now, we as individuals can vote with our feet. Just as I talked about a three-country shuffle and, you know, keep your assets in the U.S., you know, they're, they're, we're seeing the exact same struggle in the U.S. We have some really high tax states like California and New York, and because of uh, – uh, remote offices and, and this sort of thing, people are starting to flee out of the big states, out of New York and out of California. They're not willing to pay high property taxes, high sales taxes, high income taxes anymore. So uh, we're in a period of, of transition where we as individuals have a lot of power to change the tax dimension of our life and to make sure we're getting as much value as, as we can out of the money we're having to pay. Oh, that was that. Oh, yeah, that was an incredible breakdown. Actually, we saw a really cool comment, uh, Stefan. This is awesome information, man. That was great, um, great uh, information there, Clinton. Um, I think one of the really interesting things there is that dynamic that you were teasing out there. That there's this kind of competition between different countries, and for some of the smaller ones, like say the BVI or Vanuatu, and some of these other small countries, part of their competitive way they the way they compete is by having you know low tax and so on, and so. And and some of them, for some of them, the I guess the offshore investment or the citizenship by investment programs that they offer are part of a good part of their taxation, the part of their revenue. That's part of their kind of way how they kind of make oh, yeah. money, I guess. Interesting country uh, in South America is a country called Panama, and uh, Panama is uh, very interesting. It's kind of um, 
it's its own country, but everybody knows if if anything gets unstable there, the U.S. will invade it in a heartbeat because of the Panama Canal. Now, what happened is Panama has uh, a tax regime where if you draw, if a company or an individual drives their income from outside of Panama, then it's not taxed in Panama. Okay, so it's a real territorial system, a true territorial system. So what's happened is that multinationals who want to do business all over Latin America set up their headquarters in Panama. And they, they make all their money in Latin America back in Panama. Panama doesn't tax it because it's derived from outside of Panama. All right. Um, so this is just a phenomenal arrangement that has enabled Panama to attract incredible amounts of business because almost all the Latin American countries are unstable. Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela. I mean, it's a, it's a very unstable mess there. But Panama has the strongest banking system in all of Latin America. Problem is it has a little bit of a shady tax haven. It was blacklisted once and, you know, it's got a lot of issues. It's moving to progress and improve things. But uh, I would keep an eye on it. Uh, also, so if you are an individual uh, living in Panama, you're not American citizen. So any other country, they're not going to tax your income if you're a remote worker because you're getting your income from outside of Panama. And it's a nice tropical country. They speak Spanish, a little bit of English, uh, you know, great airport. Right. And so I guess the, the other thing there is uh, the question of getting like residency, citizenship and so on. I mean, you might not necessarily need citizenship, but you just might need the rights to live there and work there. Uh, that kind of thing. Easy. You go to Panama, you put down, uh, you open up a bank account, you put $20,000 in the bank account, and uh, you get a lawyer, about $3,000. Uh, they can get you what's called a friendly nations visa. This would be 45 countries that uh, Panama likes. Australia is one of them, you know, all of Europe pretty much. Uh, you get a friendly nations visa, and you now are a permanent resident of Panama. You need to go visit two weeks every two years. Uh, but otherwise, you have you can set up bank accounts. Uh, and you have residency there, and you can travel all the world. Still, say you're a Panama citizen. Keep your bank up, your business operating out of Panama. You know, so you're not going to be taxed because the income's from outside of Panama. Very unique regime. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because uh, I'm thinking back through kind of Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin people or people who've uh, famously attacked Bitcoin. People like Peter Schiff, he talks about. Uh, well, he's in uh, Puerto Rico, as I understand. And I know, um, I think even like Eric Voorhees has uh, talked. I uh, went to. I think he, I'm not sure, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he might have gone to Panama at one point. Um, but uh, I think the other point I wanted to raise as well is obviously uh, everyone's got their own different view on, uh, you know, the justice of taxation and AML laws. Obviously, you might be against them. But I think one factor that is potentially playing in the favor of the individual is that, well, I think a common book that a lot of people read is The Sovereign Individual. And part of that is like this idea of going to better countries or going to better jurisdictions for better tax laws or, or other laws as well. And so I think perhaps it's like most people grow up and they have this inertia. Okay, I grew up here, so I'm going to live here and I'm going to die here kind of thing. But perhaps we're moving more into a world where people can work remotely and then they can start accessing some of these overseas tax uh planning and overseas tax structuring that may improve the level of competition between the different countries and ideally keep it a bit lower for the individual but what do you guys do you, what do you guys think yeah I mean, yeah i think that's i guess it's really one big part i guess what clinton also said is just you have to think about where you want to spend also like the next years right i mean as out of my personal experience, I moved to Switzerland to soup, like to the crypto valley, or that's at least what they call it, because um, we also started our company there. It's obviously uh, a tax haven for people from Europe because you can easily move there. Um, it's just you have to think about all the consequences, right? You, for example, you're not allowed to keep a key to your parents' home when they live in Germany because you're just not allowed to have a residence in another country then otherwise this other country would tax you on your crypto income so it's kind of like and also the 185 days you have to be there you have to be in this other country so you need to be aware of the cultural differences you need to be aware obviously if you if you speak a different language you need to be aware of that you want to like you really need to think about cost of living especially in switzerland and, and switzerland for example it's completely different from area to area. So it's not just I, I moved to the border of Switzerland, um, like to the if you come from France or from Italy or 
or Germany, it's you have different areas and they're small like Zug or Zurich, which have a really good taxation law on crypto because you don't pay any um, crypto taxes. You just pay wealth tax at the end of the year. Um, but still, it's it would be easy for a European citizen to move there. You just have to keep in mind that you kind of give up your 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 home or your like where you where you grew up, right? Obviously, you can move back in the future, but um, it really depends on your personal situation. If you have a family, it's maybe even harder to move there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess like the future of all these taxation laws and especially for crypto, I guess. Like Linton said before, that's going to be another five or 10 years until they, they figure out the correct um, regulations there. Um, me personally and like our, our team, we are encouraging everyone to accept these regulations because it also brings crypto to the next stage, right? It's not just, it's not just a bad thing if, um, if there's new regulations coming in. It's also you have a better guideline, you know exactly how to behave. And with that guidelines, you can actually find loopholes to go around these taxes. If you don't have any guidelines, it's really hard to decide what to do because it's just not defined yet by the governments, right? So that's that's also a big big part, I guess, in, in for the mm -hmm. future. There. Yeah, Clinton, anything to add? I was talking to a client. Uh, he was from Serbia, and. Uh, he said he had lived through the time when Yugoslavia had broken up and uh, it became very lawless and there was no real central government. And, uh, you know, the, the criminal element kind of dominated the, the, the law and order and stuff. And so there was a real breakdown. And when I was talking to him, he said, I want to pay taxes. I've lived in a country where we didn't pay taxes and it was chaos. I want to pay taxes. I want a stable government. I thought, wow, it was really refreshing because so many people think that even paying a dime to a government is some sort of crime. But uh, there really is a value that governments give to you. And I think, uh, as you were saying, Stefan, that there's, you know, we should become shoppers to a certain extent. We can make choices about the tax impacts on our lives. What the government governments generally like you to do is to stay put in one spot and never move. So everybody who has a, a hand on you can tax you there. They don't like you moving around because it's tougher for them, basically changing your residency. So I, I think um, this is, how can I describe this? I mean, tax burdens are outrageous worldwide. Okay, and it has to do with the amount of services we expect governments to give us. We want the governments to give us a social insurance. That if we get old, they're taking care of us. We want the roads to have no potholes. We think that the government ought to do stuff if they're you know to make things better and regulate and define what it means for things to be organic and all these sorts of things. Let's have the government do it. Well, every time you say the government ought to, you ought to rephrase it and, and made it, I would like to pay more taxes so that the government ought to, you know, and uh, governments never shrink themselves. So uh, the only way that you can vote sometimes is just with your feet and go move somewhere else. Uh, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. Uh, and, you know, if you have very strong family ties and you love going visit, you know, the big family on Sunday and having a pasta dinner, you know, you're going to miss that if you take off and go live somewhere else. I mean, but you might replace it with something more exciting and adventurous in your life. So th there's a big, um, you have to look at the whole picture. It's not just a tax issue. Of course, of course. I think um, those are worthwhile points. I think it just kind of depends where on your view of how things play out. Like maybe you believe there would be, you know, private provision of these other things uh, and, you know, less taxation to the government and more just kind of you just pay privately and hopefully that those private services might do a better job. And maybe that's the way you would think about it. Um, but obviously, you've got to, I think the, the key point here is kind of assess holistically. And I think talking about and understanding how the taxes work is one, obviously, one important part of that picture. Um, so uh, I guess uh, if you guys have got any kind of uh, closing thoughts for the listeners, and also where can uh, my listeners find you online? Yeah. So, I mean, one more thing, especially because there's no like no final regulation um, in most of the countries, you can use that in, in order to argue a little bit. Right. I mean, it's not that you 
I mean, you can save taxes in every country, even if they have a 50% um, tax rate, like in, in Germany for the short term taxes, like that would be the maximum, but you can still argue um, about some um, forms of income in crypto because there's no final regulation, right? So you can kind of try to, to shape that a little bit moving into the future. And there's um, obviously no guarantee that this works out and this, that, um, that, you, that they accept this, but you can at least try. And we in accounting, we, we work together with, uh, with German um, uh, CPAs, with like in all the other countries that we cover as well, and especially also with Clinton, where we basically advise our, our users, if they have some questions there and if they want to have a special regulation, especially if you have a little bit more in crypto and you have like where it would be worth to deep dive into, we, we always advise them to talk to, to Clinton or to some of our, our other partners in other countries and other um, restrictions. They, they, like, it, it sometimes helps. There's always a little bit of um, uh, movement that, that you can do and there's always a little bit of money that you can save. So um, I guess that's that's one important thing to to think about. And like you said, I, us we you can find us on um, www.accounting.com. So not accounting, but it's like just the the u uh, the i instead of the u um, dot com. And um, there's also a link to to Clinton's website. And yeah, if there's any questions, just reach out to us, and we hopefully can help. First of all, it's a pleasure, Stefan, to be on your show and to talk about these really interesting things. Uh, people can reach me at uh, DonnellyTaxLaw.com. Donnelly is two N's and two L's. Uh, and uh, you can schedule a consultation with me. We, we do full service tax preparation for U.S. citizens. We also do just, you want to, you know, have a half hour tax planning consultation. You know, we could do it there. You can schedule a time, pay for it up front in any, at the time that's convenient to you. Like I said, we have clients all over the world. So you can find a time slot that works for you. We also specialize in doing tax defense in audits, people who are being audited by the IRS. We actually are, we're one of the first companies to actually do a crypto audit audit uh, for American citizens. So we have significant insight there. We have, we have a company of about nine people right now, and it's growing very fast. So I look forward to uh, talking to people about their tax needs. And uh, I wish everybody to find, uh, just pay a lot of taxes. <laughs> that means you're making a lot of money <laughs> well uh, yeah look thank you very much i mean uh, i obviously uh, i'm not a, no one's a fan of taxes but uh i, I it's worthwhile thinking about strategies around taxation and i've uh, very much enjoyed chatting with you dennis and clinton thank you for joining me thank you thank you and listeners you can find my show at stefanlevera.com that's it from us we'll see you guys in the citadels